glory be to God. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, let's stand for the reading of God's holy word. We're not going to rush this series. I may not finish this series during Holy Week, but I will continue it. And then, if you will, we'll get back to our other series. I want to preach in your hearing briefly. A message titled, Easter According to the Nicene Creed. Part 4, the Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign bus rolls on, day 731, according to my oldest son, Daniel White the fourth. If you have any questions about that number, contact him. Since January the 20th, 2017, day 1096. Since January the 1st, 2016, and I am so thankful to God, particularly on this day, Monday, Thursday, and Holy Week, that God led me to continue preaching the gospel for the most part on a daily basis. And I want to encourage all of you out there, uh, we do have a camera down, one of the Facebook Live cameras are down. So go to uh, Gospel Light House of Prayer, Gospel Light Society. Or you should have received a, an e-blast with all of the places you can hear me live. If the Lord would so lead you, you know somebody who's lost, not saved, invite them. But I want to encourage you on this Monday, Thursday, to confess your sins to repent as Christians uh, you should uh, have some compunction and guilt about your sins if you have sin in your life and get your focus on Jesus Christ as we approach Good Friday if the Lord should tarry his coming and we live because I'm looking for him any moment. Please turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye have or keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You can only be saved by hearing and receiving and believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. This is the story that never gets old. He died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren <clears throat> at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. 
Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I am humbled, and I hope that we all are humbled before you today in light of what you have done for us, in light of this, what they call Monday, Thursday, where we, we remember the Lord's Supper and how you told us as disciples, as believers in you, to love one another. Uh, Lord, I do praise you and I thank you for allowing us to be here today and allowing us to experience another holy week. And Holy Father God, we individually, as Christians, confess our sins and collectively our faults and our failures unto you in light of what you've done for us. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive us, Lord, of our sins, all of our unrighteousness, all ungodliness of thought, word, and deed. And Lord, help us to not only seek forgiveness and confess our sins, but to repent. Lord, have Holy Week to be a turnaround week, a week of repentance. And Lord, help us not to just see this as a great story, even as Christians we oftentimes do, but to allow your Holy Spirit to really move us to repent of our sins, to be revived again, to get back to you, Lord, our first love, for you first loved us. And uh, help us to be the shining lights and witnesses you want us to be in a dark, dark world. Lord, afresh and anew, grant me your anointing and your unction <clears throat> and the power of your Holy Spirit to preach your holy word once again. And Lord, where, as the old saints used to say, where I'm torn down and uh, maybe not feeling that great, I pray that you would make up the difference and build me up. Grant me not only spiritual strength, but mental and physical strength to continue to preach your holy word, to preach the gospel. And most of all, Lord, we pray for lost souls to be saved, Christians to be revived, your holy name glorified, Jesus Christ exalted and always Satan horrified at the name of Jesus Christ and at the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we right now have one of our cameras down for some strange, I'm sure, demonic reason. And uh, we pray that those people who are normally viewing right now would go over to one of the other uh uh, platforms to hear the preaching live. <clears throat> we pray that the person working on it would uh, get it fixed immediately. And we pray that uh, the devil would not get a victory as he is seeking to do, as he always does on Holy Week and most and in all of our other services as well. And so, Lord, uh, we pray that you would prevent him block him, stop him, thwart his plans. And we pray that the gospel would flow freely out of here all across the country and around the globe to whomsoever will. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, if you don't have it fixed by now, uh, go ahead on and do your other job. I can't hear you. Ladies and gentlemen, regarding 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Dr. R.C. Sproul said, When I would teach a doctor of ministry class or program, 
he said, I would ask the clergy there to define the gospel. To define the gospel. And if I got 10% of them to give an adequate answer, and that is the case across this nation, I would be happy. That is so sad. Most pastors don't even know what the gospel is. Most pastors could not explain the gospel for a million dollars. And that's why many of them don't preach it. And so many have not experienced it. In other words, they've never been born again. I know we don't like to hear that, but it's true. Because that word is thrown around so much, it has died the death of a thousand qualifications, he said. In New Testament terms, the gospel is the proclamation of the person and work of Jesus Christ, plus how the benefits of that work can be appropriated appropriated to us by faith and by faith alone in Christ. So the gospel has a narrow definition. It's the message about Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection for us. And that we, all we have to do is believe on him and trust in him for our salvation. Have you done that? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior or are you just involved in church? Are you just religious? Do you just like going to church because it makes you feel warm and fuzzy on the inside? Have you ever been born again on this Monday, Thursday? Since Holy Week is the most exciting, most important week in the history of the world, it ought to be a transformative week for everybody. Christians ought to confess sin and repent and turn from the evil ways. Lost people who don't people who don't know Christ as Savior ought to be born again. Doctor Marshall Siegel said many of Jesus' followers thought Jesus came to rescue and reign right then. They anticipated a physical and political freedom from the oppressive Roman rule. Yeah, they were, like we are today, more caught up with politics than we are King Jesus. Right now, as I speak, the nation and the world is in a tizzy, a frenzy, over something that has already been ruled on, and that really is over. Why? Because we love politics, and that includes Christians, so-called believers in Christ. We love politics more than we love Jesus, King Jesus, our Savior. Even preachers are more into politics than they are proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they were back then interested in politics than in the Lord. More interested in politics than in the Lord. For them, he goes on to say that Christ was the key to their immediate this world issues. Life now. What have you done for me lately? The here and now. 
And we have many preachers who have that philosophy today. It's all about what the people need and want now. Not some pie in the sky. Is what they say. Freedom now. Liberty now. I want to do what I want to do now. Life now. Freedom now. Power. Everything now. And it's all about the people and not about God. That's what politics is all about. But Jesus walking to the cross instead says to wait. Be patient. The rewards of following me won't come in full today. But they will far surpass anything else you could have hoped for. In this story of life and hope and freedom, death comes first and then life. Darkness and then liberating, untouchable, unsearchable light. Amen, somebody. End of quote. So ladies and gentlemen, on this Thursday, and we thank God for allowing us to make it to this day. This Thursday of Holy Week, often referred to as Monday Thursday. We are continuing our series, drawn from the Word of God, the Holy Bible and a historical text based on the Word of God, the Holy Bible that was passed down from the early church all the way to us today called the Nicene Creed. For those who might be wondering, according to Dr. William Bradshaw, the word Monday comes to us as an Anglo-French term derived from the Latin uh, mandatum, which means commandment. It refers to when Jesus in the upper room during the Last Supper said to the disciples, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you that you also love one another. How are we doing, Christians? Are you the kind of Christian who says, I love Christ, but I hate my brothers and sisters in Christ. I hate my own family members. You have such a wonderful relationship with God, but you don't speak to your husband. You don't speak to your wife. You don't speak to your children. Children don't speak and honor their parents. And then we have some who say they have a wonderful relationship with God and with Jesus and with uh, the Christians in the church, but they don't have a good relationship. They don't love their own family. Always remember, you hypocrite, that charity begins at home. Real Christianity is fleshed out and lived at the house. How you doing? Do you love your own family members? Whatever kind of family you have, do you love them first? With a Christ-like love. Or you rather rush out and be with some strangers and love them more, communicate with them more than your own family. You can't stand your family and you foolishly think that other people's family is better than yours. But one day they're going to stop you at the door and remind you that you're not family. And you're going to learn the hard way that you need to love your own family. And spend time with them before it is too late. 
how we doing with the love thing, loving one another. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Your family members are Christians too. They're brothers and sisters in Christ too. And even if they're not, God wants you to love them first. And then love your brothers and sisters in church, your friends. During this Holy Week, not only are we talking about the power of Easter and Resurrection Sunday, but we are talking about the importance of the historical Christian faith that was passed down to us from the early church. How that we as Christians who are for the most part, falling away from it, ought to return to it. You say, preacher, do you have much hope for Christians to return to it? Here's what I believe. All things are possible with God. I believe in God's word that says, ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. I also believe in the power of the foolishness of preaching. Some people think that my preaching the gospel to this cold and dead and heartless church and world uh, is a waste of time. I don't think so. I still believe in the power of the foolishness of preaching. It makes no difference to me if it's just one person that hears it and gets saved or uh, one million because one lost soul hearing the gospel and getting saved uh, is worth everything Jesus pointed out to us uh, how that we ought not to be people who lose our souls. And so many have. Trying to gain the whole world. Some Christians have lost their souls, so to speak, trying to gain the whole world. And they're frustrated. They're depressed. They're sad. Because they have found out trying to gain the whole world is nothing but vanity. It comes up empty. You raise your hands up and you have nothing. If you don't have God first and Jesus first, all of the stuff you're fighting for and you're trying to gain in this world is vanity, is empty, is nothing. It's a shame that most people spend 50 years, 60 years before they learn that. But thank God, the richest of the rich, the smartest of the smart, out in uh, Silicon Valley, even they have learned. I'm talking about true prosperity people. Not you little prosperity people who are in debt up to your eyeballs. That's not prosperity. If you have to go to work to pay for your car and to pay for your little apartment and to pay for your house and to pay for your clothes that you got on credit down at the mall, then you're not prosperous. In fact, you're worse than the poor. You're in debt. But those who are truly prosperous, like the CEO and the creator of Twitter, who is a bona fide billionaire, they have learned that you can have all that money and all the material things in the world and everything at your fingertips, all the technology, all the gadgets, the finest cars, can go anywhere you want to in the world at any time, on your own plane that you own outright 
You know what they're doing out there in Silicon Valley now? For example, the head of Twitter, he eats one meal a day, Monday through Friday. He eats nothing on Saturday and Sunday. How you doing, prosperity gospel Christians? <laughs> How you doing? He walks to work. He can drive a Bentley. He can drive a Mercedes Benz. He can drive 10 Ferraris if he wanted to and pay for them cash. He can be chauffeured to work. He walks five miles to work. He doesn't even have to look at his utility bills, but he takes cold showers on purpose. You know why they're doing that? Because they have realized that you can have everything in the world if you don't have significance, if you don't have God. That's what they're looking for. They don't know it. That's what they're searching for. They're trying to find something that matters. <laughs> All oh, the trinkets don't matter, my dear friend. And you, you're going to learn that. You, and you, some of you are learning it. Some of you are getting smart and you're starting to downsize, as we call it. Because you know it's nothing but foolishness and vanity. If you don't have God, if you don't have Jesus in a very real sense, you have nothing, dear friend. Nothing. It, it meaneth nothing. Because you don't even have peace with all of your stuff. You don't even have joy with all of your stuff. And a man can't do that for you. And a woman even can't do that for you. Even your children can't do it for you. And no matter how adorable those puppies are, they can't do it for you either. They just can't. If you don't have God who created it all, if you don't have Jesus on Monday, Thursday, during Holy Week, you have nothing. You have nothing. You come up empty and wanting. You've been weighed in the balances, and you are found wanting. So, my beloved, regarding the use of creeds in the church, Dr. John Piper, one of the most gifted theologians in the history of America, said, is there a place for creeds in the church? He asked that question. And then he answered, I think they have a really important place. But they ought to be a replacement for the Bible. And they shouldn't be given equal authority to the Bible. Rather, they are to be considered faithful expressions of the Bible. And I would add, if they are not, they can be changed. But you can't change the Bible. They can be added to, but you can't add to the Bible. We need faithful expressions of the Bible. For mere humans, both those written for our generation and those preserved from other generations. And Dr. Piper, as usual, is correct. And so, ladies and gentlemen, on Sunday we looked at the first section of the Nicene Creed, which reads, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible over the two days that followed we have been looking at the second section of the Nicene Creed which says and in one Lord Jesus Christ do you believe in him for your salvation, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father, before all ages, 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Basically, ladies and gentlemen, a creed is something that scholars and theologians, professors, Bible teachers gifted from the Lord, pastors gifted from the Lord, evangelists gifted from the Lord, the apostles inspired by the Lord. What we have been doing in the church for 2,000 years, it is an expression of what the Word of God says. It is a form of teaching people what the Word of God means. And so therefore, is good. And uh, as I've said before, I am a Baptist, and as Baptists, we're not creedal people. We focus on the Word of God. And I always say, I, I just like it. And I've used it in our family devotions to teach my children uh, the Word of God in that way, along with reading several chapters from the Word of God. From these few words, we see three important facts about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we continue. The focus of Holy Week. We have looked at the eternality of Jesus Christ, that He is eternally existent without beginning or end, just as God the Father is. Then we looked at the uniqueness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the only, the only begotten Son of God, one of a kind, not one of many. And then thirdly, we see the nature of Jesus Christ. He is God from God. I have tried to tell you for years, Jesus Christ is somebody. We're not here to glorify ourselves. We're not here, as Paul said, to lift ourselves up, but to lift up Jesus Christ, to glorify Him, to talk about Him, to introduce you to Him the Savior of the world. He is somebody special. And you need to know Him. You need to worship Him. You need to love Him back because He first loved you. So much so He died on the cross for your sins. He is God. Emmanuel. God with us. And you need to humble yourself before Him. You need to kneel down before Him. You need to honor Him. And those of you who name the name of Christ, you know you ought to do it. You need to come off of your high horse with all of your degrees and you think you're somebody. No, I want to introduce you to somebody who's really somebody. The King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you know Him? He is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, amen, somebody of the same essence as the Father. This is why I like it. I like the Nicene Creed. In John fourteen nine, Jesus says to Philip, Have I been so long time with you, Philip? And yet hast thou not known me? I'm God, man, in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with you right now. You, you got to know that I'm God. Didn't you see me walk on the water? Didn't you see me feed all of those folk with just a little boy's lunch? Did you not see me raise Lazarus from the dead? How is it that you could be so long time with me, Philip, and not know these things? 
He that have seen me have seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Man, you're looking at the Father. I am the Father. I am God. Philip. Jesus' nature is that of the Father. Emmanuel, God with us. This is why I like to say every now and then, I know some of my brothers don't like it, God died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Jesus. Jesus is complete God, complete light, complete truth. Amen, somebody. If you're not even if you're not saved, say amen. Amen, somebody. This is the greatest story ever recorded. <laughs> the greatest story ever told, man. Even saved people who've been saved for fifty years, they love to hear it. I have some dear people who they, they 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 get mad at me because I preach other things sometimes. They want me to preach the pure, unadulterated gospel every day. Every attribute that scriptures, and I do, but I do preach some other things before that. Every attribute that scriptures apply to God are also applied to Jesus. Did you know that? No one in their right mind would claim to be God. Jesus, of course, was in his right mind, and he did. He told the Israelites, he told the Jews who wanted to know who he really was. He said these words, verily, verily, that means truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Here, Jesus was not just describing his eternality. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ was somebody and is somebody special. And you need to know him as your Savior and your friend. You will never find a friend like Jesus. But by using I am, that shook the Israelites up. Oh, that, that's, that just mess with their minds, with their proud selves. By using I am, the name by which God revealed himself to Moses and the nation of Israel, Jesus was claiming for himself. All of the attributes of the Heavenly Father are part of his own nature, is his nature, because he is God. Apologist and professor Dr. J. Warner Wallace said all worldviews have distinctive beliefs and characteristics, distinguishing them from other ways of viewing the world. Christianity is no different, but in a big time way. When it comes to the nature of Jesus Christ, the deity of Christ is a Christian essential. That's why I like the Nicene Creed and I like the Apostles' Creed. Because this truth is essential. If you have a problem believing this, then you're going to have a problem getting saved from hell. Because Jesus Christ is God. Emmanuel is his other name. God with us. It has been affirmed by believers over the centuries. Based on the reliable eyewitnesses and testimony of those who saw Jesus. Before... And after he rose from the dead, Jesus was all man and all God. And as a part of the triune Godhead, Jesus is the uncreated creator of the universe. 
as bold and exclusive as this claim may seem. It is the defining distinctive teaching of the Holy Bible. To reject the nature of Jesus as God is to reject the clear teaching of the Holy Scriptures of God. In of quote, amen, somebody. And so, my beloved, this Easter season, we, are, we reaffirm our belief in the eternal, unique Son of God, Jesus Christ, who the Bible says is the express image of the Father. Do you know him? If you don't, believe on Christ today. Because as he said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Trust Christ as your Savior. And dear Christian friends who are listening all around the world, you should be under conviction right now for not living up to your Christian faith. If and if that is the case, confess your sins and repent. Get your heart right with God during Easter week. For Dr. Edward Perronet said, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Crown him, ye morning stars of light, who fixed this floating ball. Now hail the strength of Israel's might, and crown him Lord of all. This song holds a special place in my heart. For when I used to preach uh, in New York on a yearly basis, uh, this church would... They knew this was my, one of my favorite hymns. The choir was sang this song during the revival meeting. All hail the power to Jesus' name. It continues, ye seed of Israel's chosen race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Sinners who, whose love can never forget the wormwood and the gall. Go spread your trophies at his feet and crown him Lord of all. Let every tribe and every tongue before him prostrate fall and shout in universal song the crowned Lord of all. Amen, somebody. Now, dear friend of mine, if you are with us today and you are a Christian, make sure you get your heart right with God. Get your heart right with the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess your sins and repent. Get out of your sinful mess. You say, preach, I don't know how. Pray to God and ask Him. He already knows about the mess. Ask him to help you get out of the mess, and he will help you. Let's pray. Holy Father God, on this Holy Monday, Thursday, during Holy Week, as we remember you, and you, Lord Jesus, we don't understand it all, but we thank you for it all. Thank you for giving us the grace and the faith to believe in you, Lord Jesus, and to know our Heavenly Father through you. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the gift of your Holy Gospel that made it so plain to us, and you opened our blinded eyes, and you unstopped our deaf ears to save our souls. Now, Lord, we come before you, many of us who are broken down Christians, who have sinned and who have done 
uh, things not pleasing in your sight. And uh, we're under conviction because we are not living up to your name. And Lord, we individually and collectively confess our sins on this Monday, Thursday. And we ask you to forgive us of our sins, Lord, and uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness as you promised. And help us to repent of our sins and to turn from our evil ways in the church. And Lord, you know where we live. You know all about us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would not give us rest until we fully repent of our sins and get back to you our first love. And now, Lord, we pray for those who are under the sound of my voice and under the sound of your holy word, who are not saved. Open their blinded eyes today and during this holy week, save their souls. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and forsake. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're with us today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Allow me to show you how you can place your faith and trust in Him for salvation from sin and hell. First, accept the fact that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's laws. We all have, from the Pope on down, everybody has sinned against God. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have broken His Ten Commandments found in the Old Testament. Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin. There's a penalty for breaking God's commandments. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. This is also stated in the Old Testament. We die because of sin. Our bodies go to a grave because of sin. Our soul, when it leaves the body, goes to hell if we have never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for our soul's salvation. And hell is a very real place, and I always remind you of that because most preachers don't preach on this. They just tell you the good news about heaven, but there's some bad news called hell in the lake of fire that people are in right now and that you will go to if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess your sins and repent. Accept the fact then that you are on the road to hell if you have never repented of your sins and trusted Christ as Savior. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10:28 these words, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell is a very real place. In another place in the Bible, it's called the lake of fire, and here are the people who will go there. You might find yourself here. In Revelation 21.8, the Bible says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, fearful people, too afraid to trust Christ as Savior because they're concerned about what people may say or think, the unbelieving people who call themselves atheists and agnostics, many of the intellectuals of our world, are going to the lake of fire, going to hell, because they refuse to believe in Christ, they refuse to believe in God. And the abominable people who commit abominable acts are going to hell, they're going to the lake of fire. You don't have to worry about it. Some of you think, well, jail is not enough. Death is not enough. You're right. Many of the people who have committed heinous crimes are in hell right now, or will be going to hell if they don't repent and trust Christ as Savior. Abominable acts such as 
molesting children. Raping children, raping women. Abominable acts such as incest, having sex with family members. Doing sexual things with family members that you're not supposed to be doing. All of these things are abominable in God's sight. They're, they're if you will, beyond sin. They're disgusting even to sinners. Homosexuality. Lesbianism is an abomination in God's sight. Men kissing on men and men having sex with men, women trying to have sex with men, women trying to have sex with women. It is unspeakable. It is disgusting even to normal human beings. It's called an abomination. Human beings trying to have sex with monkeys, horses, men and women. There are people who do that. Disgusting, abominable thing. The abominable people. They're going to hell. They're going to the lake of fire. God is of what they may say. And murderers, people who kill other people. Take the life of others. Murderers. Who kill children. Kill family members. They're going to hell if they don't repent and trust Christ as Savior. And whoremongers. Men and women. Who whore around. Men are whoremongers. Women are whores. Who have sex with people they're not married to. Oftentimes repeatedly. With many different people. Whoremongers and whores. Prostitutes. Male and female. They're going to hell. You say preacher. How dare you preach this. Well it's in the word of God. That's why I'm preaching it. I've never heard anything like this. That's precisely the reason why I am preaching it. Because you need to understand that you're on the road to hell. This is not a game. And God is spelling out who's going to hell. Whoremongers. Those of you who are shacking up. Uh, those of you who are having sex for money. To have your rent paid and your car note paid. You sell your body to any Tom, Dick, or Harry or Ethel, or Bertha, or Rose. Whoremongers and all sorcerers. Everybody who practices witchcraft and voodoo. Everybody, the little boy who goes on TV lying to people about, he's talking with the, his, the dead family members, he's lying to hell, he's talking with demons. Sorcerers, people reading your palm, looking into a crystal ball and got you looking into it as well. When you're gone, they take the crystal ball and throw it in a box. And idolaters, people who put anything or anybody before God, some have put their children before God. Some have put their spouses before God. Some have put their cars and their houses before God. They stay home on Sunday morning and wash their car instead of go to church. And God is the one who gave you everything you have. Idolaters will have their place in the lake of fire. And if God did not get you on the other ones that I just mentioned, here's the last one. And all liars... All liars, black liars, white liars, red liars, yellow liars, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fine brimstone, which is the second death. How is Jesus looking to you about right now? How is Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, who came down from heaven to die on the cross for your sins, was buried? And rose again. 
How's he looking to you right now? He should be looking very good. So believe on him today. Trust him as your savior. Get your eternal life insurance squared away, signed by the blood of Jesus. And believe on Christ. Now hell is, and the lake of fire is bad news. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Are you ready to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ about right now? Are you ready to admit that you are a sinner and that you're on your way to hell and that you want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that you're going to believe on him? You're believing on him right now that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again. And you're willing to pray and ask him to save you. For the most says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9. That if thou, you, shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, you, shall be saved. For whosoever, that word whosoever means anybody at any time. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved to what? Saved to heaven, to be with God, to be with Jesus, to be with the saints, and to be with the angels forever. If you don't want that, then reject Jesus Christ. If you don't want to go to heaven, reject Jesus Christ. That's your choice. If you want to go to heaven and not go to hell, trust Christ as your Savior today. And He will save your soul. You don't have to join a church to be saved. You don't have to give any money to the church to be saved. You don't have to do any good works to get saved. You don't have to get yourself together to get saved because it would take you, you would not even, you can't even get yourself together in time. It's going to take you a lifetime to do that. So don't try. Trust Christ as Savior and let Him help you to get yourself together and He will do that. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and thou you shall be saved. And if you're willing to trust Him as your Savior today, follow me in prayer. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have done evil in your sight. I have broken your Ten Commandments. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. That he died for my sins. Was buried and rose again on the third day. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. And change my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past and help me to turn from my evil ways and to follow you in the new life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake, amen. Now, dear friend of mine, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in your heart, if you believed on him, that he died for your sins on the cross, was buried, and rose from the dead. Allow me to say to you congratulations on doing the most important thing in life, and that is trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com and read my pamphlet titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10:9, I am the door by me of any man into in. He shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And dear friend, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and this is very important, on this Monday, Thursday, in Holy Week, 
please email me at dw3 at gospellightsociety.com or whatever email you see where you are and let us know. We have some free material that we want to send you. <clears throat> if you have a prayer request, please email that to us as well and we will pray for you until you tell us to stop. Until next time, my beloved, which, Lord willing, if the Lord tarries is coming, and we live, will be tomorrow, 